Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm a musician and I'm so happy to be part of Build Electrons for the very first time this year. Many of you in the Build Electrons community probably remember me as a composer because I majored in composition during my BMAS at Sakem, but afterwards I developed a special interest in improvisation which started at the Music Dance 021 residency in Cape Town and after that I did a Master of Music in Viola Performance at the University of British Columbia. So my current practice draws together viola performance, composition, improvisation and embodied design research in music technology. And improvisation runs through pretty much everything that I do. So for example, I use improvisation as a composition technique to make idiomatic sketches. Um, I use it as a design tool to test how an interactive music system um, works and feels at various stages of the iterative design process. And of course, I improvise while I'm performing. And I like to think of myself as a multitasker. For example, the design process and the composition process are symbiotic and I don't separate them conceptually. So it feels like I'm using the same part of my brain for both those processes. Likewise, I use an iterative design process. So when I'm rehearsing, it's actually part of the design process as well because I'm testing the current design iteration and improving what's quick or essential to improve um, and make changes to during the rehearsal and taking notes on larger changes that I need to make in the code before the next rehearsal. An approach that has been extremely useful to me in my research practice as a maker of interactive music systems is the research through design approach. Um, and in the research through design approach, um, the importance of validity through reproduction is shifted from the resulting artifact as would be in a scientific experiment to the process while the research artifact, which is in this case, a new system or a new artwork, um, these are framed as concrete embodiments of theory and technical opportunities. And there are four critical elements for evaluating research through design. Um, these are that research should follow a clear reproducible process. Uh, research should comprise a significant invention that contributes to progress in the field. The work should provide extensibility where the community, which is you, can make use of the process in a future design or implement insights gained from the designed artifact, which is my performance, and the research should be relevant. So within research through design, a practice that I'm very inspired by and that I use a lot in my work is the SOMA design practice, um, which comes from SOMA aesthetics, where SOMA uh, relates to the body and aesthetics relate to an appreciation of beauty. Um, so SOMA design practice um, uses somatic engagement to study the embodied experience of designers and users to inform the iterative design process. Now, one of the reasons that research through design and SOMA-based design strategies are so useful for artistic researchers is that we can have a valid process that is reproducible, but ultimately the artwork can be something completely different and made to express something completely different because that's the whole point of the artwork. And it's not like scientific research where you want the experimental result to end up exactly the same. What I particularly love about the research through design process and how it helps me a lot is that 
it's kind of like when you have the blank page in front of you and you have to put the first dot on the page to start making the work. That can be a pretty daunting, um, a daunting experience for me. But with research through design, as soon as you've done anything, that's part of the design process. And so just by starting, you've already, you've already got something to write about. And it also makes me um, feel encouraged and <laughs> or at least motivated when something goes wrong um, at some point during the design process because I think, oh great, now I have a problem to solve that I can write about. And once I solve this problem, which I will, um, my solution will be useful to other researchers. So I think the best way that I can share with you how I use research through design in my practice is to talk about the making of the new work that I created for the Bode Electrons Festival, which is entitled A Mass. For me, I feel really fulfilled when I can create a work that stretches me as a performer, a composer, and a designer. And if I can gain new insights in all those spheres in the making of the project, then that's my ultimate goal. So for a mass, I knew that I wanted to create a piece where all of the electroacoustic material comes from the sound of my viola and where I could interact with the material by playing viola. In terms of hardware that I wanted to explore, I recently bought a wavering by Genki Instruments um, as a graduation present for myself. Um, it contains an accelerometer and a gyroscope, so I wore it on the index finger of my right hand, which is my bow hand, because, you know, with viola playing, that's where so much of the timbral expression comes from. For software, I work in Max MSP, and I've also been learning more about interactive machine learning um, for artists in the online course on Cadenze called Machine Learning for Musicians and Artists. Um, it's taught by Rebecca Fiebrink, who is um, the creator of the Wekinator software. So I was really inspired to try out using some of those algorithms in a mass and it links in so well with Max MSP. So those were my initial requirements um, to start making a mass. Within a research through design approach, I also knew what sort of methodological framework I wanted to use to make a mass. And there's currently a shift in the music technology community and in parts of the HCI community as well towards a more human-centered approach which is where Soma Design comes from. So specifically, researchers are drawing from embodied music cognition. And I think this is quite a natural progression for artists to take as we try to find our place in an increasingly digital age, which is where I am speaking to you from right now. Um, so one way that this approach translates to music technology is through the action sound approach, which comes from an acknowledgement that there are intrinsic relationships between action and sound qualities in the acoustic world, and then taking inspiration from what we observe and feel in the acoustic world as we build up a vocabulary of action sound couplings in the electroacoustic realm. As a performer and an improviser, I'm particularly inspired by the action sound approach as a way to synthesize my relatively new skills in music technology with my embodied knowledge of viola playing that I've spent the past 20 years or so building. So I incorporate action and sound into my practice on many levels. When I start an interactive music system project, I like to think quite broadly and conceptually about how I would like action and sound to relate in the work and then build from both sides and meet in the middle to then explore how I can facilitate interactivity between those two spheres.
So I'm going to speak a bit about action first. Uh, like I said before, I use the wavering by Genki Instruments to track ge gestures or actions of my bow arm. One of the main reasons that I got the wave ring, aside from it being a really hip piece of equipment, is that um, Genki released an API in the Python coding language um, for accessing the raw data stream. So the wave sends a dictionary containing quite a large amount of features every second. Um, so I had a lot of options on which features to track. Um, for example, you have access to raw gyroscope data, as well as the Euler angles, which refer to the um, pitch, roll, and yaw of the ring in relation to whatever specific starting point you choose. So I spent some time exploring how these features behaved through a simple data sonification, just with sine waves and a visualization with a couple of sliders in Max. So there are also a lot of other features like magnitude and gravity, but I decided to focus on the raw gyroscope and accelerometer values um, and then just throughout the design process to compare how those um, behaved compared to the Euler values. I also want to talk about how I use acoustic action sound relationships um, as inspiration for electroacoustic action sound couplings and this also extends to how I select different gestures to use in the interaction. So it's all very well to perform a musical gesture on viola and see how it translates to data and sound on a computer, but that's not necessarily going to show you all the different ways that the gesture could occur within the context of the surrounding materials or how likely you are to perform that gesture in flow while you're performing. So that's why I examine my gestures through improvisation and I already have a pretty good idea about, you know, the kind of improvisational language that I use when I'm performing because um, I've been improvising for a while now and another way that I analyze my gestures um, is by making video recordings of myself while I'm playing um, so that I can compare my memory of the embodied experience of flow um, during the flow of playing with an objective point of view. And so that's how I came to identify different action sound relationships that I naturally make on my viola. And once I had a broad action sound vocabulary, I narrowed it down by seeing which actions were quite distinct in terms of the movement and rotation of my index finger. Now I'm going to speak a bit about how I built up the sound world. Um, so I tried out a few different synthesis techniques in Max MSP at first, and I was initially quite determined to make my own additive and subtractive synthesizers because I kind of liked the imagery of um, using gesture to carve out sound in space. But then I remembered um, something one of my mentors said to me, which is, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so I think it's sometimes much more about how you use existing technologies in your systems in a creative way. So in the end, there are two different electroacoustic processes in a mass, and both are from the Mubu Max MSP library, developed by Urcam. Firstly, I use the mubu.concat tilde object. Um, to concatenate is to link or chain together elements in a series, and so concatenative synthesis is quite a similar concept to granular synthesis, except that the grains are often a bit longer than in granular synthesis, and they're also ordered and sorted according to an analysis of the sound. So the concatenative synthesizer in the Mubu library 
analyzes an audio file and then it's sorted into individual grains of sound according to quite a few different sound features. Um, these grains are visualized as data points in a graphical display in the iMubu object and you can choose which features increase along the x and y axis. Then the interaction operates like a simple joystick in 2D space. So by dragging the mouse over the graphical data display, um, the KNN algorithm inside the Mubu.concat object classifies which data point you're closest to and plays that grain. I tried out using a few different combinations of input features, but I ended up choosing frequency and periodicity. So frequency, of course, refers to the fundamental frequency of the sound, so it's pitch, and then periodicity refers to the quality of the sound, so how much noise is in it. And that's a combination that I'm also quite interested in as a violist, um, since I can play the same note a whole lot of different um, ways with a whole lot of different sound qualities. So I decided that I wanted to be able to record my own sounds into the buffer during the performance so that that ended up defining the compositional structure of a mass as well because it now begins with an acoustic improvisation on viola. Likewise, the features that I chose to use in the concatenative synthesizer really had a big impact as to the sounds that I ended up making in the acoustic improvisation. You'll notice in the performance, if you watch it, um, that I use quite a few harmonics, little colenio taps at different pitches, and a whole lot of unpitched bow scrapes and scratches. The aesthetic of my acoustic playing was also inspired by the other electroacoustic process that I used, which also comes from the Mubu library, and I decided to use the additive synthesizer as well because I wanted a more continuous kind of sound to contrast the concatenative synthesizer, which can have quite a disjointed and erratic feel to it. And compositionally, I also just wanted more than one layer of sound going on in addition to my viola. So the Mubu.additive tilde object is an additive and noise synthesizer. It reconstructs the harmonic and residual content of a sound recording, and you can interpolate between them these two contents, so you can choose how much pitch and how much noise to hear. You can load three different sounds, probably more than three, but I didn't try that for this project, maybe next time. Um, and you can listen to different combinations of harmonic and residual content in, in each sound. I would have liked to explore recording live audio into this object as well during the performance, but I made an executive decision for myself to rather spend my energy exploring the piece from an aesthetic and sonic perspective and making an interesting inter interaction between action and sound. So instead, I recorded three quite different mini improvisations on viola and used an application called Spear to separate the harmonics from the residuals according to the amplitude of the partials. I initially tried out using three different sustained sounds because I thought it made sense to have um, three different pretty consistent timbres but when I loaded those files into the object and started playing around, I realized that most of the residual content actually comes from the attack of the notes. So although the additive synth component was working and sounding pretty cool <laughs> to blend between, the noise generator was really boring. So I went back and limited each improvisation to its own distinct musical affect with an emphasis on texture so that there could be some variety when moving between the buffers. In technical viola terms, I ended up with a colenio buffer, one that had some pizzicato and regular bow changes, and one where I just played an open C string as smoothly as possible because that's one of my favorite notes. <laughs> and after playing with those buffers, I ended up going back to the third buffer again 
and re-recording something a bit more interesting with more bow changes and only then to pass my imaginary interesting enough threshold. So before I launch into talking about the interaction, I am going to talk a bit about parameters because that's really important. So in a mass, I use my gestures to interact with all of the synthesis parameters. Um, you'll notice that I like to talk more about interactivity than control because I think that's a much more interesting and inspiring framework to create in. So the only things that I control with my MIDI foot controller are faders to give a sense of compositional structure and I'm also able to turn amplitude modulation on and off. Before I got into that I first worked at a consistent sound level to construct the two different sound worlds by identifying which synthesis parameters I wanted to be able to interact with in the live performance and figuring out the maximum and minimum values for each parameter so that when the time came to connect actions and sounds, I knew what I was working with. Much like a granular synthesizer, the concatenative synth allows you to vary the length of each grain and the period, which is the frequency at which the grains are triggered. So I took some time to explore different combinations of grain length and period and I decided to use quite a variety of combinations. So for example, if both parameters are have small values, um, the synth actually starts to synthesize a sound like a square wave. So if I were to translate that sound onto viola, I might end up using a lot of overpressure from the bow. Whereas if the period is relatively small but the grain size is quite large, then you get an accumulation of sound and it's a bit like freezing a timbre, which you can do with a guitar pedal, I believe, or just playing a note with constant bow speed and pressure on viola. Um, the grain selection is quite straightforward. It's just determined in 2D space, which can be visualized with an X and Y axis, like I mentioned. So it accepts two values that um, select a grain, depending on whatever parameters you've selected for those axes. For the additive synthesizer, that's also visualized on 2D planes in Max MSP using two different node objects, where each object takes an X and a Y value, which ends up being four parameters. You can also choose where in the timeline of the buffers to play and scrub through the audio. And the object comes with a couple of different presets where you can choose how long you want to scrub for, uh, whether you want it to loop or scrub forwards and backwards like a pendulum. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about mapping. So how I mapped input gesture features to output sound parameters and the interaction between those. So when I talk about machine learning in an artistic context, I'm talking about giving a computer a data set of gestures, an example data set, giving that to an algorithm, training the algorithm to output certain parameters or numbers, um, when it receives those input features and then once it's trained running that algorithm so that it can respond to the live interaction and output those same or similar parameters depending on what i'm inputting for a mass i used two different algorithms in the working into software the first algorithm I'm going to talk about is the decision time warp algorithm. So essentially a decision time warp um, examines how numbers change over time. So it can be used for speech recognition. If you're tracking audio features, you can train the computer to recognize certain words 
In this case, I use it in a musical context to track gestures by teaching the computer different gestures, giving it a few examples of different gestures, and then it can recognize which gesture I am currently performing and output um, according to that gesture. I noticed that scrubbing forwards and backwards um, on the add to synth using the pendulum setting looked quite similar to the changes over time of the likelihood output of a decision time warp algorithm. So at the start of the gesture, the likelihood is at its lowest, but by the end of the gesture, it's at its highest. So if you repeat the gesture over and over, it kind of swings back and forth, a lot like um, scrubbing um, an audio file. So I connected the likelihood output to the playback line of the movie.additive tilde synthesizer and depending on which gesture I play it um, goes to a different playback start location. The other algorithm that I used in a mass is a regression algorithm. I just used linear regression though I did experiment um, with using polynomial regression and um, a neural network, but I decided that um, linear regression led to the clearest interaction. For example, I was just tracking the gyroscope data and I put my hand in a bunch of different positions, all of which I used to play viola so I had some pizzicato position, I just bow on the low string position and a bow on the, um, the high string position. And I trained three different output settings to each of those parameters. And then in live performance, um, it's able to blend um, and interpolate quite seamlessly between those three positions. So you can move around in 3D space and um, it will have a continuous and smooth output. And what is pretty great about a regression algorithm is that you can have a um, different amount of inputs to outputs. You can input all those different features, pitch, roll, and yaw, and then output to as many parameters as you like before your computer chokes. So I ended up um, making the algorithm listen to the raw gyroscope values and I connected those to uh, seven output parameters, um, those being the frequency and periodicity along the x and y axis of the concatenative synthesizer graphical display. Um, so the selection of the grain and still with the concatenative synthesizer, the um, length of the grain and the other four outputs were the two x values and two y values for the additive synthesizer. So when I was exploring um, this mapping, um, I did so um, by testing out different design iterations and what it felt like to play with them. I experimented and I tried out the interaction with the Euler values as well as uh, with the raw gyroscope values. And what I found was that it was a lot easier to make a predictable interaction with the raw values because the Euler angles kept um, it kept resetting the starting point um, or the starting point kept moving every time I went over the maximum value of um, a parameter. So that's not ideal for <laughs> performance. And I also tried out putting accelerometer values as inputs into the regression algorithm, but I found that um, 
Yeah, in the end, just using three raw gyroscope values was the most effective and um, clear to work with um, as a moving performer. <laughs> and I also decided to connect the periodicity parameter in the concatenative synthesizer still to a more direct um, mapping um, rather than for it to come from the same regression algorithm that was selecting the grain just so that that could have a bit more independence. So the way that interactive machine learning works is um, I mean, you can, you can know how different algorithms work and build up some intuition on how to solve problems that you're um, facing, but ultimately it um, is quite largely a trial and error process, um, definitely an iterative design process where you just keep making little adjustments taking note of how things feel and making the appropriate changes. Um, so one of the um, changes that I made was I added a um, just a simple randomizer um, step in between the um, outputs going to the X and Y selection in the concatenative synthesizer because when I first worked with it, it was kind of working, the regression algorithm was kind of working a little bit too well, and it was selecting exactly the grain that um, I had trained it on. And although that's so great and efficient, it was artistically not very interesting. So I added a randomizer in between the output from the Y commuter and the input to the green selection. And that just meant that um, rather than selecting that exact spot on the Cartesian plane, the um, algorithm would um, select a general area and then it would kind of behave a little bit, uh, dance about a bit in that area. So that's one way that I made the interaction more interesting, and that's quite a common solution that I learned about in by reading other research through design papers, where if an interaction just feels too direct and efficient, you can add another layer in between. So now I had my two sound worlds, and they were connected through an interaction um, between action and sound. But um, to make that interaction a little bit more interesting, um, I decided to think a bit about the composition um, on a few different time scales. So in general, aesthetically, I'm quite interested to include silence in my compositions. I think um, for me, it's something that is quite often missing in electronic and electroacoustic music and that might be because I come from a Western classical background and training um, where you know we often say that the expression or the music lies between the notes. So I tackled this exploration quite simply by using amplitude modulation to interact with the levels of the two different electroacoustic sound worlds. So in order to make amplitude modulation, I first set up an envelope follower to track the level of my incoming viola signal. And I used the envelope follower actually by Sarah Bell Reed, whose Patreon I follow. Um, I applied it to sound coming out of the movie.additive tilde synthesizer. And I scaled and smoothed it until it was sounding the way that I wanted it and feeling the way that I wanted it in the embodied interaction. And then I had the task of modulating the concatenative synthesizer output level as well. But I didn't want the two synthesizers to modulate to the exact same signal at the exact same time 
but rather to sound kind of independently from each other, or to have the potential to sound independently from each other. So initially I tried applying just a randomized delay time to the amplitude modulator, um, and then applying the delayed signal to the concatenative synth level, but then I realized that it would be much more effective and in line with my whole action sound approach to use um, some kind of gesture signal coming from the wave ring. And then that way, the concatenative synth could still produce sound whenever I moved, even if I wasn't making a sound on the viola. So I tried a few different combinations. I tried connecting it to different outputs from the regression algorithm as well. Um, but then I decided to, um, and I even um, tried combining different um, incoming gyroscope features with incoming sound features. Um, but ultimately what worked best was to just do a calculation of the overall acceleration um, by using the abs tilde object to keep everything positive and then adding the three acceleration values together um, for them to be clipped and scaled. I also thought it would be kind of interesting to um, then use the amplitude modulation signal coming from my viola audio input, which was, as you remember, already applied to the additive synthesizer um, level output. But I used that signal as well to um, interact with the period of the concatenative synth um, synthesizer. It really does take a lot of rehearsing and um, exploring and honestly playing to figure out how to play the system in a way that is idiomatic for yourself and the system. So for myself as a violist and for uh, myself as someone playing this new system that I've made. Um, and I suppose one of the um, main things that I noticed during these rehearsals slash um, design iteration tests is that the Genki ring values would max out, um, which is, um, you know, quite normal for working with an accelerometer. But a way that I could actually really easy, easily deal with this was not through code, but just in the way that I performed. If I simply turned my body a little bit, the values would all be great. Um, and if it didn't work that way, then it would work this way. And I also, um, I struggled a bit the first two um, attempts because I had just been flat out coding for the past um, week and a half, two weeks, um, you know, to try and get this project ready to record for the festival. And in that time, <laughs> I had not really been practicing very much. And so I kind of got there to record this performance and realized that I was a bit out of practice with performing and I didn't feel um, comfortable and at home on viola. So I think that is just a never ending balance that we have to deal with in this practice. And so I learned quite a bit about how um, ultimately, even though this is a very tech heavy composition and design project. Um, in the end, it's a performance. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that in line with uh, the research through design approach that you found this presentation to be either useful in your own practice or at least interesting and inspiring. And if you would like to contact me, I'm very reachable through the email contact form on my website. And if you want to keep up to date with my shows, um, I always let people know about them on Instagram. Um, thank you very much to Theo 
host for um, inviting me to be a part of Boat Electrons and thank you all for attending the presentation. I'm looking forward to watching everyone else's presentations and performances. Um, it will sometimes be four in the morning for me, but <laughs> I'm going to try and be there. Have a good festival! <laughs>